Hey, hey. Alrighty. Um, lecture three, chapter five, transduction, the magic, the miracle of transduction. Let's go to this now. Yeah, there we go. Um, you know, I say the miracle of transduction, but it really is. This is one of the, I mean, in my mind, this is one of those kind of really cool, interesting topics that focuses on something we don't think about very much, um, you know, until we start kind of imagining ourselves more as these complex biological machines. And we start thinking, well, how do we work? Um, so let's jump in. Um, so I, I just want to start by really, you know, highlighting something I've already alluded to a few times, which is that distinction between sensation and perception. Um, and we're going to really be focusing a little bit more on the sensation part, um, the, the bottom up flow of information a little bit. But this is a what you're seeing here is a Necker cube. And the cool thing about this cube is I, this can, happens to some of you naturally. If you stare at that cube, what you might see is that it will reverse on you. It will change what it looks like. Um, in the sense of sort of how it is in three dimensions. So maybe it's happening natural, but let me walk you through a little bit and, and give you a sense. So the idea is you could take this cube and with this, it's a little easier with these two, with your mental power, or with your mind, you can take the blue plane and try to see that as closest to you, the closest part of the cube to you. So in this case, if I look at that, this is closest to me, then what I'd see is the cube sort of receding backwards and to the right, okay? And it's going back in, in space that way, and this is, this is facing me close. In this case, if this is facing me close, then I can see that, but now the cube recedes backwards and to the left, and sort of down and to the left, where here it's up and to the right, here it's down and to the left. So the first question is, can you look at these two, and can you you know, see them those ways? Can you force the blue to the front? And then once you can, once you kind of get a sense of that, think of where this is over here. That's this one, right? Think of where this is over here, and that would be this one. Okay, and now let me put this back and just do what you were just doing over there, but with this. So take that first blue thing and bring it to the front, and then take the other blue thing and bring it to the front. Of course, it's not blue now, which makes it a little <laughs> trickier, right? You got to kind of remember. But if you do this, if you kind of work at this while, you can make it go back and forth. And I'm doing it right now, back and forth. And I can just flip it from these two dimensions. By the way, a person's ability to do this is related to their intelligence. So don't take it personally, but try to try to make it work. <laughs> um, okay, um, what's the point of all this? Uh, the point is there's what's out there in the world, and that's just a set of lines. And then there's how we perceive it in our minds. And what we're seeing with this is we can have the same set of lines, and yet our perception of what's out there can shift back to from one perspective to another to another and so our perception is changing independently of our sensation because the sensory experience the bottom-up flow of information is not changing it is just the black pixels on that screen what's changing is how we perceive what we're looking at uh, and so that shows the power of those processes between sensation and perception, right? The ones that determine our reality to an extent. Uh, but what we're going to do now is gonna, we're going to go a little more slowly through this. We've talked a lot about those top-down influences, how memory affects stuff. But now we're going to say, okay, hang on. Let's just put that aside for a moment. And let's focus more on the bottom up flow of information first. And, and especially to a, a specific characteristic of it or a specific moment, um, that's really crucial, the moment of transduction. Okay, let's jump into this. So we've talked about that sensation versus perception. We have the information coming in, and by sensation, we're really referring to that information hitting our, we call them receptors here. Um, you know, we sometimes call them our senses uh, or our sensory organs. Uh, these are our sensory organs. And this is how we connect to the world. So this is, you know, what I like about this picture is the pink versus the blue. And when you think about that pink versus blue a little bit, I don't know why the pink goes way up here. Uh, but, the, but the pink is sort of the world inside your skin. And let's include your eyes and everything. That's, that's right. So we have our inner world and the, inside our body, everything that's our body and our brain and all that kind of stuff. And this body lives in an outside world 
world. And for us, you know, the brain is, is, is in the middle of the inside world. And so for us to be able to effectively survive in this outside world, we need a way of getting information from the outside world into the inside world and, and to our brain um, so that our brain actually can know what's out there. That's what these sensory organs are doing, right? They are the interface between the outside world and the inside world. They are the place where information comes to us about what's in the outside world. And so when we talk about that raw, you know, information impinging on our sensory organs and that initial processing of it, we're calling that sensation, sensing the world. So that distinction between sensing the world, but then, you know, down the road, perceiving, recognizing what's out there, you know, all that goes in, involved in, in, in the recognition of objects and all those things we've talked a little bit about already. But we really want to focus now on this. There's the energy out in the world. And yeah, and, and it impinges on our senses. How does it get from outside to inside? That is what we're going to call transduction. So one of the things I want to start with, you know, I've, I've, uh, I've highlighted this a little bit. There's brain areas, and we've talked about these. And these are these sort of primary cortical areas, right, related to this input of, of information from the world. Uh, we talked uh, about vision. We talked about touch. Uh, we didn't talk so much about smell, taste. Uh, we did a hearing. We said hearing is on the inside, so you don't see much of the primary cortex. That's why there's just a hint of blue, but there's more. It's just on the inside of that lip. Um, and the textbook talked a little bit about taste and smell. Um, so, you know, ultimately, this is where the information has to end up. But it starts in the outside world. So how does it go from there to here, to the brain? Okay. And then how do we look at something like this, which is really, you know, when you think about it, just a set of colored weird lines uh, of various sorts you know this is what we're sensing this is the raw image that's coming in but when you look at this you can actually with a little bit of work know what you're looking at um I, when i do this in a class it doesn't take long for so someone to say well fireworks yep fireworks but then i can even say where where are the fireworks and somebody in the class knows some of you know Niagara Falls. Um, so these sort of color patterns you see here and maybe even some of these towers and stuff off in the distance, um, people can recognize, recognize Niagara Falls. Now, now, typically they've had to have been there or seen this, you know, somewhere that you have to recognize. So you have to have seen it in the past in order to recognize it now. Um, but people can see this as a fireworks show over Niagara Falls. That's what we perceive, right? That's how it ends up. It ends up being, um, we, we see the world and everything's been recognized and classified and, and we see things that we could do stuff with that could be relevant to our goals. But before it gets there, it's got to get in. Okay. Every one of our sensory systems has limita limitations. Um, we love to, you know, one of the things I keep trying to do in this course a little bit is, is bring us off our high horse as human beings where, you know, we tend to think, oh, we are the be all and end all of, of living species. Um, but we're not. I mean, we, we've been able to dominate the planet, that's for sure. But in a lot of cases, when you look at um, abilities we have compared to abilities other animals have, you start to realize, one, we're not the be-all and end-all, and B, there's a whole lot of stuff in the world that we don't even know about. We don't sense. Um, and so, humans do not sense all that there is to sense, as, as the saying goes here. So bats, for example, use echolocation, so their hearing is so good that they can hear the way things echo when they send out a, a, a sound and they can basically use that to know where things are, the way we use vision. You know, why don't we do that? We can't. We don't have that sense. Uh, sharks have these little things in their snout called the ampules of Lorenzari, very fancy. They allow them to sense electrical activity. This is how sharks hunt. Um, they sense the electrical activity that comes from muscles. Remember, we're all bioelectric machines, right? And so when fishes are doing their things, they're actually giving a little bit of electrical current out. 
and the sharks can sense that. In fact, one of the reasons you often see sharks attacking cages, sometimes with tourists in them going, ah, is because the metal on the cage messes with their electrical senses and it annoys them. Just like someone shining a bright light at you might annoy you and you might get mad enough to throw a rock at that light. The shark is basically saying, ah, I want that cage gone. And it's attacking the cage, not the people in it. We don't. Anyway, rattlesnakes <laughs> are sensitive to low frequency vibrations that we can't hear. Um, and dogs can smell cancer. Uh, you know, they have great smell, uh, great ability to smell things that we never smell, including things like a foreign disease within a person's body. They have cancer sniffing dogs. So all these things out there that other animals are sensitive to that we're just not, and even the stuff we are sensitive to, we're limited. So light, for example, what is light literally? Well, out in the real world, light is energy. And, and you may have heard a whole wave theory of light and all this stuff. We're gonna kind of go with a wave notion here that, that it's energy that follows certain wavelengths. And of all the wavelengths, this is the wavelengths of energy that are out in the world, everything here. And it ranges from 10 to the minus 20 in cosmic rays up to at least a kilometer. This is broadcast band frequencies. So these are all different kinds of energy that are that, that's out there. There is a little tiny band here that we actually um, can sense. And we sense it with our eyes. We sense it as vision. Little t look how small of the available energy that's out in the world. We can get these other things with technology, right? We can use technology to hear a radio uh, wave, but we can't see it. It's all around us. There's radio waves all around us. Our radio can pick it up and tell it to us. We, we don't, other, it's, we're invis it's invisible to us without that tech. All we can be sensitive to, the only wavelengths of light energy that we can detect are this little tiny narrow band, which if we kind of blow it up, becomes your famous um, Roy G. Biv, backwards red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet, uh, your colors of the rainbow, right? With red being the longest wavelength and the violet being the shortest wavelength. That's all we see. There's all this other stuff all around us. We don't even know it's there. We don't even see it's there. All we see is light of these specific wavelengths. Uh, we can get to something like infrared, right? Infrared goggles. What do infrared goggles do? Well, they, they kind of they're sensitive. The goggles themselves are sensitive to the infrared. They can, they can detect the longer wavelengths and then they shorten those wavelengths um, to make it fall here. And so when people put on the goggles now, they can see infrared information coming through as red. The goggles have brought that information into our sensory range and they allow us to see that. You know, night vision goggles would be, would be an example of that. Um, but we need the technology because we can't do it without the technology. Okay, so that's the first thing to realize. There's all sorts of information in the world. We are, first of all, restricted by the senses we have, and then even those senses are only sensitive to a certain amount of the energy that's available. The thing we know as the real world is just one little part of what's really out there. How is that for your mind messing kind of factoid of the day? Okay, so when we talk about transduction um, and, and how that energy gets into, the, into our bodies, um, we have to talk about the eye here because it's, it's the eye that's going to bring light in. Um, I now realize I have a 3.30 meeting, um, so I am going to pause the lecture right now and come back to this in a bit. I have to. All right, I'm back. <laughs> I have no idea. My hair is probably crazy because I was outside in a meeting. Anyway, here I am back again. <clears throat> um, yeah, where were we? Oh yeah, transduction. The cool thing of transduction. Okay, so we're talking about that, the cool process by which uh, information goes from the outside world to the inside world. And of course, let's start by talking vision. Your textbook, by the way, will talk about this process for a number of different senses. I'm really gonna focus on vision because, <clears throat> first of all, that's our main sense. That's the one we rely on the most. Um, and you know, once we tell the story for vision, 
the story remains the same for the other senses. It's just the details of the story that, that change. Uh, and so I'll leave you to, to learn all those detailed differences. But let's focus on vision. And, and so obviously the sensory device we use for vision is our eyeball. Um, I, I sometimes have some fun when I do this in, in a normal class. It's harder to do here. But one of the things we start with is just to go through the eye very, very quickly. I think you know all this already. But just to make sure you remember it um, when we talk about some of this stuff. So first of all, when we look at the eye, we can talk about the iris. That's the colored part of the <coughs> eye. Um, that is essentially a muscle. Excuse me. It's a muscle that controls the size of the pupil. And the pupil is the black spot. So the pupil is where the light energy goes from the outside world into the eye. Okay, which is not transduction yet, but it did get into the eyeball and it does that through the pupil. And so what the iris does is control how wide that pupil is, how much light gets in. You notice I talk about lights out here. You know what I like to do in my class here. And I always make a bit of a joke about it. I turn out all the lights and I ask the students to stare deeply in the eyes of the person beside them, which is always a little weird, um, but literally to watch their pupil. And so I talk for a little while. And while I'm talking, when it's dark, the pupils open up. They get really big because there's not a lot of light around. So they want to let the light in so they can see better. Um, but then I suddenly flip the bright lights on. And when I flip the bright lights on, you know, you've all had that experience where it was like, oh, what, what is that experience? First of all, that's too much light getting into your eye. Your pupil is too wide open. And when it suddenly gets bright, all that bright light comes in. Now your eye responds quickly. Your iris responds quickly by shrinking that pupil. Um, and, and that allows us to adjust so that we don't have so much light coming in. And you can actually watch somebody's eye and watch that process happen. Uh, and so... That's kind of fun. You learn about those two parts of the eye. You know, forget about, forget it. Uh, the sclera is the white part of the eye here. Um, it's a little harder, so it's a tough membrane, and and it serves protection, and of course, it keeps the inside of the eye, inside the eye, and the outside, outside, so to speak. Um, so it gives us a little bit of protection. Um, our eye is filled with a number of different fluids. So some of them are in what we call the cornea, and you can see this here now. Uh, where we have a fluid-filled outer coating of the eye, and that's mostly to give moisture and nutrients to the eye. Um, often liquids in our bodies are doing that. They're delivering mo uh, moisture, yes, and nutrients. Uh, the lens, now this is an important one. So the lens is here. So it's right behind the pupil, right? If light comes in from the pupil, it goes through the lens. And the lens is used to focus that light onto the retina. Think of it like a projection that's coming in and, and it projects on a screen, right? Except the screen is the retina. And we're going to talk about the retina, the very back coating of the eye. And what this allows uh, the eye to do is focus by, by squinting. You know, when people squint, this do whatever. By doing these little muscle movements, we can bend that lens. And we can bend it in such a way to create things in focus. So that's why you see people who have trouble seeing in distance, if they don't have their glasses on, they will squint, right? And what they're squinting is bending that lens. And when you bend it enough, that blurry distance becomes a little more clear. Not very comfortable, it can give you headaches if you're squinting all the time, etc. So much easier to put a pair of glasses in front of all of this that does that work for you. Um, but again, this is, this is how the eye does it. And that process is called accommodation the process of bending that lens to try to focus the eye. And so we, we can accommodate um, our eyes so that we can try to see things clearly um, as we look at them. And something close versus something far away, um, we bend that lens a little different to keep it in focus. Okay. Aqueous humor um, is, is, is the, the notion, uh, so it's not actually labeled here, I see, but it, this is the liquid that's sort of in front of the eye, so it's nourishing the front of the eye here, and then vitreous humor is inside the eye. So that's all the inside the eye is full of liquid. If you ever feel like little things are drifting in front of your vision, little dust particles or whatever, they are. <laughs> they are getting, they're floating around here, and when the light comes in and it's trying to get back to the retina, if there's something floating around in front of it, we will see that floating around in our vitreous humor. Um, 
I could I could tell you about the yeah no I won't <laughs> we'll leave it there uh, now the retina is where the action happens this is where fu- we're suddenly going to get into transduction here so all of this energy has has come into the eye so I guess you could say it's into the body but transduction is really about changing the form of that signal so as it comes through it's still light energy okay. <sighs> Okay, (laughs) it's still light energy, but when it hits the retina, it's going to be transformed from light energy into a neural impulse, into the action potentials that that you know of, because that's how the brain and mind uh, process information. So we have to change that light energy into the sort of energy the brain uses, and that's biochemical, right? Bioelectric chemical messages, you know all about that now. So how do we go from light to that? That is the process of transduction um, that we've been talking about. And so, yeah, we're just imagining, you know, there's this this light energy out in the real world, but it's going to um, be transduced. Something is going to happen that will allow this to turn into neural energy. And so suddenly it's energy the nervous system can deal with. Um, and then it will get processed um, and yeah, it'll eventually lead to perception. Don't worry about all this kind of uh, crazy stuff here. Um, I, it's just that notion of going from light energy to neural energy. Um, and so different senses, by the way, will the, the, the environmental form of the energy is different, right? If we think of touch, it's, it's not light waves. It's actually sort of pressure uh, of, of the touch. And so we have to change that pressure into neural energy so it's always got to be changed into a neural signal and for every sense system transduction is that process that changes it from whatever it's normally in whatever it is in the real world to a neural signal that our brain can process how does this happen for light so let's talk about light light's kind of weirdly interesting uh in a number of ways so This is, there's there's, there's a couple of weird oddities about this that you have to get. So first of all, this is the back of the retina, the very back of the eye. And the funny thing is there's these things sort of on top of that. So when light comes, it will actually pass through these layers that we'll talk about, the ganglion cells, the bipolar cells, and it will go all the way back to this retinal layer And then it will stimulate these rods and cones, these things you see here, which will send the signal back here, which will send the signal back here, which will send it to this optic nerve and out of the eye. So it's like the light passes through all of these things doing nothing except landing back here. But once it lands back here, then it stimulates these guys that stimulate these guys that stimulate these guys that then send the information down to the brain. These guys, these guys, and these guys are all going to start pre-processing that signal. Right in the eye, there's some processing going on of what's coming in. It all starts back here. And this is really where the transduction happens. So at the back here, these rods and cones, as we call them, are photoreceptors. So, So what that means is they react to light. And they react to different wavelengths of light. So first of all, there's two different kinds of photoreceptors, um, some that are called rods and some that are called cones. And you kind of just look at them, right? Some are very rod-like. They're just a straight, straight cylinder kind of thing. Some have these canonical kind of views where they're fat at the bottom and skinnier at the top. Um, The rods are all the same. Um, Let me remind myself. Yeah, okay, so we're going to go into this. The rods are all the same. The cones come in three varieties, red, green, and blue. And that refers to the um, wavelength of light they are sensitive to. So we're going to talk about all three. We'll start with these guys. We'll then go into the bipolar cells, which you'll see does image sharpening. And it makes the edges and contours of things crisper. And then finally, the ganglion cells, which sharpens the color and brings in the, the, the color of yellow into the processing, which is really kind of crazy uh, because this is just red, green, blue, right? But ultimately, we're sensitive to, to things like yellow as well. How does that happen or variations of yellow? Uh, so you'll get that story. So that's what we're going to do now. It's just 
walk our way through here. The light starts by hitting these guys, turns into a neural signal, which then goes here and then goes here and then goes out of the eye to the occipital lobe, crossing the optic chiasm as it does, but don't worry about that. Okay, um, let's start with the photoreceptors. So what are these photoreceptors? Now, I, I sometimes think of them as, as sort of vampires <laughs> in the sense that when light hits them, if it's the right kind of light, um, it will cause a chemical reaction. So you know how vampires kind of and they hit the light and stuff happens to them, right? It's kind of like that with photoreceptors. When light hits them, <clears throat> it, it, it produces a chemical reaction. Uh, in, and, and that's the beginning of that chemical electrical thing, right? So the light produces this chemical response. Um, what, you know, when it does so depends on, first of all, whether it's a rod or a cone, and then which kind of cone it is. So first of all, for the rods, they're just responsible to re responsive to the amount of light that's out there, the intensity of light. They don't respond to color. The best way to kind of understand the rods is, you know, go back to that example I just talked about where the classroom where I turned out all the lights. Put yourself in a situation. Give it a try sometime. Turn out all the lights. Just sit there for a little while. <clears throat> <clears throat> but then pay attention to your visual perception. And... Hopefully there's no light anywhere. If you, if you have a light anywhere and that light has a color, you will see that color because the light will carry the color. I'll come back to that. But if you got all the lights out, what you'll mostly see is, first of all, at first you can't see a whole lot. It becomes really black. But then as your iris opens up, as the pupil gets wider, you get more and more light and you can start to see things um, in a low light condition. Those are the rods that are doing that. They're very good in low light situations, but they don't give you any color. So one of the things you'll probably realize is that things look mostly black and white or shades of gray. Uh, around you when everything's dark it, it tends to all be sort of shades of gray unless like I say there's a big red exit sign or something then that if, if there's the light behind it then it'll look red but everything in the low light situation will be like sort of shades of gray this is what rods are for we rely on our rods when there's not a lot of light in the world so when we're out at night doing things and we're trying to see things, it's the rods that we use and they do a good job for us in, in those sorts of conditions, low light situations. When the light is, is not low light, when it's powerful light, that's when the um, cones come into play. And these cones, again, there's these three varieties, red, green, or blue. And so what that means is that the red cone only has the chemical reaction it does when light of the red wavelength hits it, right? Each of these colors have, has light energy of different wavelengths. Um, red, of course, was that long wavelength. Uh, and so it's only that color of light that stimulates the red cones. Um, the green ones are sensitive to green light. The blue ones are sensitive to blue light. Uh, and so when their kind of light hits them, then they produce this chemical reaction that kicks off a neural impulse. So, so the photosensitive, so we call them photosensitive because they're sensitive to light. Light triggers this chemical reaction uh, and it starts a sort of process going on here uh, where it's going to eventually pass this information on to the next layer, okay? Now, so the actual transduction is what's happening when the light is hitting these. And, and it's done via a bleaching process in which the photopigments get split. And that's what causes the action potential. So the, the light bleaches these chemicals, causes a chemical reaction, which, which gives rise to an action potential. That's transduction. That's when the outside world becomes the inside world, which is kind of cool. Let's follow the story from here. So right now what we have is we now have input from the rods just sort of telling us how much light is out there and where there's more or less. But then the cones giving us information about the colors that are out in the world in various ways. So that information flows to the bipolar cells. The bipolar cells, um, I'm going to talk about this abstractly and then I'm going to let you feel it in just a second. But the, the bipolar cells um, take this input from the photoreceptors 
Uh, and then they process the signal in a way that tends to emphasize edges and contours. So in a, in a situation like this, it's very easy to see where the green and blue you know, edges are. But especially when it gets a little more, you know, less contrast between the two, um, it can get a little difficult to, to see where the edges of objects are. And remember we're talking about that figure ground process, that gestalt thing? One of, the th one of the first challenges of visual processing is to try to figure out what the objects are. And objects are often defined by their edges and contours. And so this is going to sharpen them. And it does so by using a special kind of cell called a bipolar cell. You're going to be able to read a little bit about it in the textbook. Maybe you want to do some Googling to get a sense of it. They're, they're kind of cool. I'm not going to go into a detail um, other than to say that when photoreceptors associated with spatial, spatially close parts of the retina are sending very different signals, then the bipolar cells accentuate these spots, aiding in, in our ability to perceive the edges. So it's, it's really good at detecting when the light coming from one part of something is a little different from the light coming from another. And in situations where that's true, it actually exaggerates that difference and it sharpens those edges for us. You're gonna feel it in a second and you'll get a sense of it, okay? So what do we have? When light came to the photoreceptors, it got detected, got turned into a neural signal that was color-coded. Then it got passed to the bipolar cells, which looked for differences in the color um, close places that have slight differences in color and it accentuated those differences to make the edges and contours sharper. Then it comes to these guys, the ganglion cells. This is a very interesting kind of cell and we like to, we like to talk about it just because it's, it's kind of cool and interesting in, in a number of different ways. Um, they are these what, what we call opponent process cells. So before we get into all the details of this, let me just give you the general idea. A lot of nerve cells um, in our brain um, fire or don't, right? When what they're looking for is there, they fire. Um, when it's not, they're quiet. But these kinds of cells are different. They've found a way, like, okay, let me hold back. <laughs> so if you're a nerve cell that fires or not, then what can you do? Well, basically you can send a signal that what you're looking for is there or it isn't. That's all you can do, right? So it's there or it's not. These guys are gonna use a different approach that's going to allow them to say whether red is there or if green is there. They're gonna be able to signal a more complex signal. How do they do that? Well, they do it by having a resting firing rate that's somewhere between fast and slow. So if you could, Literally, if a, if a cell was firing and when no color is present, we're gonna, do, we're gonna start with this ganglion cell over here. I'll talk about that. When no color is present, no red, no green, it kind of fires at this rate. Now, if red hits one of these things, it speeds up. And if red disappears, it'll go back. You're gonna see it'll overshoot, which is kind of cool, but it'll go back. We'll, we'll come back to the overshoot. When green is present, it slows. So the clever thing the brain has done here is if we have a cell that just fires at a medium rate when nothing is going on, now there's two, th two ways it can signal stuff. It can speed up or slow down, right? Those other cells start at zero, so you can't slow down from zero. But if you start at a medium rate, you can speed up or slow down. That's what these things do. Now, there's a problem with that. So in these red-green cells, for example, you cannot see both red and green, right? Because red will speed this up and green will slow this down. This is why people have trouble sometimes with color blindness of red-green or blue-yellow. It's because of problems with these cells that are, in a sense, discriminating for most of us. Is it red or is it green? I can't do both. I can do one or the other. Is it more red or more green? And so we see things that are just a little red as more red and things that are a little green as more green. But somebody who's colorblind finds those two colors kind of blend in. Okay, so that's just a, that's just a problem that can, can happen here. But here's the really weird thing, too. When... Okay, so the red-green is easy enough. If red hits, this speeds up. If green hits, it slows down. What about over here? 
Well, if blue is present, it slows down, just like it did over here for green. That part's easy. But what about yellow? Here's the weird thing that happens. If yellow is out in the world and it strikes the retina, um, there is no yellow photoreceptor. But, what, but the red and the green are also both sensitive to yellow. So they respond to red or green, but they also both respond to yellow. So that means when yellow is present, it sends both a red and a green signal on through the eye. That's going to kind of paralyze this guy, right? Because uh, the red's going to make him want to go faster. The green's going to want to make him go slower. He's going to stay right where he is. But it will actually make this cell fire faster. So this cell is sensitive to situations when both the red and the green photoreceptors are saying, yep, there's something there. And it knows that that means yellow is there. Crazy, eh? So yellow stimulates those two photoreceptors, and then the brain kind of recognizes that later on as yellow. Uh, and so now we have these four primary colors that the brain can build images from, uh, and that allows it to get really rich uh, images of the external world. Okay, some of this was a little fast, but you're going to read about it as well. And, and what I want to do here, I think, yeah, okay, I'm going to start there. I'm just going to give you a couple of demos to make you really kind of feel this. Um, yeah, we'll start with this. I'll just throw it on there. I would like you to put your eyes right about here. Okay, and I'm going to move my mouse, but keep your eye there and stare there. I'm going to move the mouse, but just keep staring there. As I talk to you, keep staring there. Now, what do you see? You see a blue word stop against a green um, background. What I'm going to do in a second is press the mouse and this image is going to disappear. But you will still see an image in your mind. Let me let you experience it first and then let me tell you what you're... Ex well, uh, uh, mm, mm. No, <laughs> I'm not. I want you to look for a couple things. So first of all, I want you to notice that you will have an after image. An after image will stay for a while, but that after image will have a couple of interesting aspects. First of all, the colors will change. The stuff that we're currently seeing as blue will be more like yellow, and the stuff that we're currently seeing as green will be more like red. So we, we will see an after image with sort of a yellow word stop on a red background. But I also want you to pay attention. Look right now at how crisp the letters in the word stop are. Keep your focus, if you can, right in the middle, but just kind of look with your periphery. Um, that you can see the letters STOP are pretty crisp. That is your bipolar cells, sharpening the edges. The after image will come from your ganglion cells, the ones we were just talking about. And it will go right to your occipital lobe, but it won't go through the bipolar. So, that, so it won't get crisped. And so the, in the after image, when you see the word stop, notice that it's also not as crisp. It's a little fuzzy around the edges, okay? And that's what life would be like without um, bipolar cells. So you ready? All this talking, three, two, one. All right, so you should, should see, I mean, I certainly see a big red pinkish thing. I see sort of the word stop in yellow. It's kind of gone for me now. It was there for a while, but it was there in yellow, and it was very fuzzy, okay? Um, you, you can do that again if you want. Stare right in the middle there for a second. Um, let's stare, charge this up. And, and let me just, as we stare, explain to you what's going on. Those ganglion cells, those opponent process ones, you know, I said like right now, there's a bunch of blue being stimulated. And so we have a bunch of blue things firing away. When I remove this, the blue is gone. And so these ganglion cells try to go back to the resting potential. And the, and the green that's there is, will also be gone. They try to go back to that middle part, but they overshoot. So remember one was green-red? When, when we have green, it's firing like heck. When, is, when the green is there, we remove the green, and it tries to go to that middle rate, but it actually slows down too much, and it brings us to the red territory. That's why the green becomes red. And in the same way, the blue which is firing now slow on that one, when the blue disappears, it tries to go up to the middle spot, but it will overshoot and go up into the yellow. And so we'll suddenly be seeing yellow. You know, neither the red nor the yellow are ever in the real world. It's just our ganglion cells overshooting um, when they try to get back to that middle position. You ready to see it again? Here we go. Okay, red. 
And hopefully you can see that little yellow. It sometimes seems to move on me a little bit too. I have to sort of follow it around, but yeah. Okay. You got the sense there. Um, so, so that, you know, what that demonstration shows is what these things are doing. Um, again, why is the yellow stop fuzzy? Because it's coming right from the ganglion cells. Um, it's coming from, oops, shh, sorry. It's coming from here. This is what's causing all those reversed colors to happen. And it's, it's, we're, it's caused here and it's sending it right to the optic nerve. So it's not going through these ones, which is where the sharpening happens. So that's why the stop looks kind of fuzzy. Why do all the colors go the opposite way? Well, that's because of these, right? And so again, when the, when the green is there, it's being pulled way down here. But as soon as we remove the green, it tries to go back here, but it overshoots and brings us up into this pink color. Um, that's why it was pink a little bit. And then eventually it, it, it comes back down and it kind of gets there. And that's when we no longer see an after image. And similarly, the blue stop, you know, was down here, but we remove it and it shoots up to this yellow a little bit and then comes back here. Okay, cool, right? So that demo kind of holds it all. Play, play with yourself. And, and here's a fun one, by the way, I use in class too. So, so stay right around here. And, and this is just a sort of, I guess, a mini joke I like to use a little bit where I say, you know, psychology class will, will bring you so much. When you come to psychology class, you just never know what will happen. Um, so for example, you know, as we stare in here, you know, would you think you could come to the, to come to a class like this or watch a video online and suddenly what happens? Oh my goodness. Did you just see Jesus? <laughs> he was just there for a minute. If you do it again, stare. So this doesn't have any color involved, right? This is just, um, black and white. Uh, and, and it's kind of funny because they've been very clever about doing things so that it doesn't really look like much when it's the white on the black, when it's the reversed. So this, this is actually the opposite image of, of the original, so to speak. But when you, when you go next and you see the Jesus there, you know, a couple of things happen. One, he emerges. So the white becomes black, the black becomes white, but, it, but, it, but, the, but it's nice. The weird thing about this one is the after image seems sharper than the original image. It's not really sharper. I mean, if you look at this, it's actually very sharp. But what it is, is your top-down process is coming into play. This doesn't look like anything we've seen before. So we just look at it and it looks like a blob of whatever. But it turns out that reverse thing, um, that's something we've seen before. It's an image of Jesus that we often see around. And so we just are, are, we just need a little bit of sensation to support that. And our top down goes, oh my God, that's Jesus. <laughs> Doesn't say that. Um, but that's what you kind of see. You ready for once more? Let's see if it'll work. Uh, I, had, I had it for a bit. There he is. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. There he goes. Okay. Whew. There you go. All right. Come to psychology. See Jesus. I just try to, you know, I, I try to be a one-stop place for you guys. All right, cool, cool. going to leave that lecture there. Um, see you in the next one. Bye-bye.